they open the doors for us. Because otherwise, I don't know if I would have been here or if anybody would get to know any of us. Fueron personas muy especiales, ya que fueron las personas que nos prepararon el terreno para que nosotros tuviéramos una, te una temporada o una carrera bien brillante. Marvel and kind of tip my cap at what they were able to do in their careers, having to overcome those type of adversities. Claro que sí, yo creo que son un orgullo dominicano porque como te digo ahorita que la, le están abriendo la le, le abrieron la puerta. Babe Ruth, we still know who Babe Ruth is. Uh, you know, the next move was Jackie Robinson, and when he opened the doors for minorities. And, and the black player. The Latin player, I think, took the game to yet another level. La pelota para el dominicano es su comida, es la cena, comida y de todo. Ya ellos fueron los que iniciaron y tomaron la primicia de tener el béisbol hacia la grande liga y de levantar el patrimonio y la bandera dominicana en cada uno de los países extranjeros. La gente habla de ellos como si estuvieran jugando ahora mismo. Aún los muchachos que los vieron jugando hablan de, de ellos como si estuvieran bateando ahora mismo la pelota. Baseball was brought to the Dominican Republic by Cuban sailors and expatriates at the turn of the 20th century. The game grew in popularity during the U.S. military occupation from 1916 to 1924, when Dominicans played, and more often than not, beat teams of American sailors. Eleven years after the Americans left the country, the man destined to become the first Dominican Major League star was born. My name is Felipe Rojas Alo, and I was born on uh, May 12, 1935 in Haina. Not too many people, maybe 10, 12 family, maybe uh, 50, 60 kids. Haina was paradise for all of the Alus. Walking south, the Caribbean Sea was there full of fish. I remember seeing the bottom of the ocean because it was so clear and the lofter walking around there. We had places to run and throw, a lot of room to see the, the ocean or see the sky at night. We were really free. My father, uh, he was a very athletic man. I believe most of our baseball uh, speed and, and arm, all of that probably come from, from the Rojas side of the family. Uh, my mother, uh, Virginia Alo, she's what you could call a real tough, loving mother. And I said to this day, she's very much the boss. My name is Juan Antonio Marichal Sanchez. I was born in a little village west of Santo Domingo, named Laguna Verde. I grew up in a farm owned by my mother. We plant rice, bananas, platanos. We ate real well without having any kind of money. 
I never met my father. He passed away when I was three years old. My mother never remarried. She wore black dress for 20 years. Since my father died, she never wore lipstick and her earrings, never. My name is Manuel Mota Geronimo. I was born 1938, February 18, in Santo Domingo. My father passed away when I was about six years old. Very difficult for my mother. Can you imagine raising eight kids without a husband? Those were difficult, difficult days, but one thing my mother had, she has faith. My family was poor, but a lot of class, a lot of pride, and a lot of dignity. We have we have very happy life, real happy. You know, we sometimes we go fishing in the river, sometimes we go hunting with the slingshots, and. Uh, most of the time we play ball. Education and religion. You used to pray before you play. You gotta go to mass, nine o'clock to 10 o'clock, and then if you don't go to mass, you won't be able to play baseball. We play in the street. Hit it with the hands, make your own ball, make your own glove. For glove, we used to, we used to make their own gloves, you know, we call them trocha. I used to play with uh, army boots. Uh, my, my uncle Juan uh, got me a, a pair of boots for anything, to work, to, to go to school, and I was using it to play baseball. It said that one day I slid and I took all the skin off one kid's shin. And then they, they took me out of the game and I couldn't play for a long, long time. Cada cual, verdad, tiene su recuerdo de esto por aquí. Pero ahora mismo estoy viendo dos muchachos que apuesto a que son jugadores de pelota. Recuerdo que cuando comenzamos a jugar, cuando éramos muchachitos, con esto fue que comenzamos a jugar primero. Lo que antes nosotros cogíamos pedazos de esto y lo tirábamos. Que se movía mucho y nosotros inconscientemente aquí con esta parte del coco hacíamos eso y creo que eso nos convirtió a nosotros en bateadores que no se ponchaban mucho. At that time, the only thing I wanted to do was playing baseball. But I didn't know that you could make a lot of money or become multi-million dollars rich, you know, like the kids today, the players today. Those days, I, I just have that in, in, in inside of me that I want to be a baseball player. And I want my mother to listen to the radio where, when I was playing. Uh, and I, I used to tell her, you're going to be so proud to hear that, that Manico is doing well. I remember back in 1948, the Brooklyn Dodgers, they came to play exhibition game in Santo Domingo. A familiar figure returns to the Brooklyn Dodgers. While manager Leo DeRocher talks things over at Theodore Trujillo, our camera sneaks a close-up of Pistol Pete Reeser and base-stealing infielder Jackie Robinson. I got to see Jackie Robinson play. It was a, an incredible baseball game for a young youngster who wanted to someday play the game, you know, beat somebody. We knew what, what was going on with Jackie Robinson uh, to an extent. We knew the race problem. I remember a teacher told us that uh, the only reason the Dodgers were having spring training is because Jackie Robinson, you know, they, they want to keep him away from the problems in the South. But we heard the stories, but to, to us, that was, it really didn't have any relevance because, hey, I wasn't going to go play baseball in Florida or anywhere else. 
Dictator Rafael Trujillo had invited the Dodgers to the island in 1948. Though not a fan of the game, Trujillo realized he could use baseball to make his regime more popular. A big crowd and a familiar cast in the dugout are here as President Trujillo of the Dominican Republic throws out the ball. It wasn't the first time that Trujillo used baseball as propaganda. In 1937, Trujillo hired Negro leaguer Satchel Page, Josh Gibson, and Cole Papa Bell to win the Dominican championship for the team bearing his name, the Ciudad Trujillo Dragones. But while the dictator only cared for baseball as a form of propaganda, his son, Ramfis, was a dedicated fanatico. When Ramfis was only nine years old, Trujillo made him brigadier general in the armed forces. When Ramfis was older, he became commander of the Dominican Air Force. And the Air Force Baseball Club, Aviación, became the Playboy's personal fantasy league team. With the power to draft any young Dominican into the armed forces, Ramfis was able to force the best Dominican players to join the Air Force and play baseball. Among his recruits was Manuel Mota. Ramfis saw Mota playing in a Santo Domingo school game. The very next day, Mota received his draft notice. In 1955, Mota and the Air Force team traveled to Manzanillo on the border with Haiti to play the United Food Company team in a doubleheader. In the first game in the morning, we face skinny right-hander throwing underhand and side arm. The name of that right-hander? Juan Marichal. He impressed the Air Force manager, supervisor. He also impressed Ramfis Trujillo. Next morning, you know, I, I hear that knock in my, in my door about 8 o'clock in the morning. I open the door and I saw it. A lieutenant, dressed, you know, from military outfit, and uh, he handed me that a telegram. So when I when I read it, it said, "Report it right away to the Dominican Air Force." Signed, Rafael Trujillo, hijo. That means Rafis. I left to go to Laguna Verde to see my mother and show her the the telegram. She was mad, she was furious. Finally, she said to me, well, son, you can't say no to those people. They told me that I was gonna play baseball and study, go to school. And when I got there, it was nothing but baseball. <laughs> because we're the soldiers. The only thing we had no guns. <laughs> yeah, we only play baseball. He used to come and watch the game. He used to come right behind no play. <laughs> I don't want to do any, anything wrong or make any mistake when he was watching the game. I only lost three games in 14 months. We went back to Manzanillo and played for, play a doubleheader. And you know we lost both games. Rafi didn't believe in that. So <laughs> he got every player to spend five days in jail and the manager got 30 days, and Biruta Pichardo got five days. <laughs> In the early 1950s, Horacio Martinez, a star shortstop of the Dominican and American Negro Leagues, became the New York Giants scout in the Dominican Republic following baseball's integration. In December 1955, Martinez signed the star of the country's Pan American team, Felipe Rojas Alou to play baseball with the Escogido Lions of Santo Domingo and the New York Giants. That spring, as the fight over segregation in America was coming to a head, the Giants sent a load to their minor league team in Lake Charles, Louisiana. They stuck me with the Lake Charles team. I had no idea of what was waiting for me. So we arrived in Louisiana, and right away after they were looking for places for us to stay, and then I started to find the difference. The next night, we had our first game in Lake Charles, and I, I didn't play, they didn't play me, and I was kind of, didn't know why. 
Uh, they, they, they found an interpreter, and the interpreter told me that I was on hold, and they, they were going to try to, to play me in uh, some cities that were maybe more friendly to the black. I remember go going into Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We were passing a uniform, maybe hoping that they would respect the uniform. They, they didn't let us in. There was a policeman that singled us out, said, no you, no you, that I understood perfectly. And we were made to go back to the dressing room, take off the uniform, and they put us with their black fans in left field. I know we watched the game like fans there with the blacks. They were trying to pass or make it into a law that the, 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 the black and white couldn't be on the same field. And, and they uh, finally the, the law passed. I was uh, shocked because we always looked up to the United States, to, to the America. The word democracy, it was big to us because we, we were living at that time under a dictatorship. The Giants initially resisted, but finally opted to send Felipe out of Louisiana. They shipped me to Coco, Florida. The bus ride took me two and a half days. I more than once felt to continue on to Miami and come back to the Dominican Republic. But I, but I thought about Horacio Martinez. Not so much my, my mom and dad. I, I didn't want to let him down, uh, and I stayed. Thank God I stayed. But, but uh, in that bus, and I ride back uh, to Florida, uh, almost three days, many times I felt like continuing on to, to come back home. In Florida, Felipe showed signs of things to come, winning the league's batting championship. But he could not escape racism, on or off the field. I had an incident happen to me in West Palm Beach. The white used to go inside the restaurant, have their dinner, and then bring us the food. So one night, the manager was driving the parking lot on his way to the restaurant, and he saw the four blacks inside the station one. And he did not like that. He came to one of the windows and he told us to get out, get out. The three Americans got out and I didn't get out. I, I refused to get out. Five minutes later, a police car came to get me. When I said something in Spanish, then the officer stopped. I guess he was gonna, by force, get me out. So some of the kids saw what was happening and they went in and they got the manager and then the manager came out. The manager drove the station wagon with me inside and parked it across the street. I never got out. Uh, that was, I say, my first act of rebellion against racism. To me, the, the, the test of Louisiana and Florida, it brought out of me some things that I didn't know about me. I decided that I was going to be a baseball player when, when, when that stuff happened uh, in Florida. I decided that I was going to go the entire road and I was going to fight whoever or whatever to do so. On September 26, 1956, after Felipe finished his first year in the minor leagues, Ose Virgil became the first Dominican to play in the major leagues. Being a rookie, I remember very clear, uh, my first at bat, uh, I was actually shaken. I mean, my knee was shaken. It made me proud uh, to be in the first Dominican to play in the major leagues. In San Francisco, the big city is big league for the first time, and a gala parade down Market Street bids the San Francisco Giants welcome as they open the season in their new home. 1958 is the, it's the year when the Giants moved from New York to California. I had a pretty good idea that I was going to make that club sooner or later. On the 6th of June of that year, I made the club. And the next day I played my first game. It was so memorable. I got three, three hits and four at-bats. Felipe joined the recently moved Giants, a team led by future Hall of Famers Willie Mays and Puerto Rican Orlando Cepeda. 
Philip to me was one of the guys that I chose to like a great deal because he was such a quiet kid, uh, never gave any trouble. You know, I like, I love to go out dancing and having a good time. And Felipe always stay in the room, checking the Bible. He was very serious about the game, you know. I mean, I was very serious. Juan was very serious. Well, he was incredible. My first year in uh, Daly City with Orlando Cepeda and Ruben Gomez, my first year. Then the second year, I lived in, in North Beach with the hippies. I, I didn't even know where I was moving. I went to living with the hippies there. Sometimes the team arrived at 4 o'clock in the morning, and it was like 12 noon. Everybody was up, and I was one of the guys there on my way home. That was beautiful. Then, then we moved from there. I found out, I found out that it was not the right place for a baseball player to live. Ay, cara sucia con prajabo. Pa que lave tu camisa. Mira, cara sucia con prajabo. Pa que lave tu camisa. Who's the best player of the Dominican Republic? Complete player. I would say Felipe Lou. Back in the Dominican Republic, Horacio Martinez was busy signing the next wave of Dominican giants, including Felipe's brothers, Mateo and Jesus, Manny Mota, and Juan Marichal. They offered me $500. <laughs> Man, I was so happy when, when, they, when I got that offer. So I tell them, yes, right away. I was the happiest man in earth when the when I knew that I was going out to go to the United States to a different level. Soon they were in the minor leagues, coping with American culture. Horacio Martinez, he signed me as a pitcher. Why he signed me as a pitcher, I will never understand. Two innings and I walked 14 or 16 batter, not because of my control problem, but because my nerves. I was, I still am a very nervous person, but I was so nervous that I couldn't even throw strikes. Marichal empezó en clase B6. Después había que ir a B, A, A, doble A, triple A. Y ahí empezó y ganó más de 20 juegos. Creo que ganó 23. Y había, era como una anécdota, que en esa época estaba el Papa Juan 23 y entonces las dos cosas las recordaban cada vez que lo mencionaban Juan 23 Juan 23 In July 1960 Juan Marichal made what might have been the greatest pitching debut in the history of Major League Baseball uh, My first game in the Major League was the 19th of July 1960 it was a night game. I remember exactly uh, what was going around the bench on that after the fifth inning when they they kept looking at the uh, at the scoreboard and, 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 and watching inning by innings that I was I was pitching a no hitter. Nobody was saying anything. Nobody was, was talking on the, on the bench. They knew, you know, that I, I was pitching a no hitter, and I, I, I knew it too. Eighth inning, Clay Darimpo came to the plate, and uh, as a pitch hitter, and Tom Sheehan came up to the mound. Orlando translated to me, and uh, he said, "Well, Tom Sheehan don't want you to throw this guy a fastball." I said, okay, let's, let's go with the breaking ball then. And uh, the first pitch I threw was a breaking ball, and I hit a, uh, a single to center field. In the first game, he threw a one-hitter against Philadelphia. I mean, you can see right there that he was good. His, his way to be a Hall of Famer. The newspaper there, 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 there. They were talking about Juan Marichal for, for a whole week. I got somebody to read it for me because uh, uh, I didn't know any English at that time. You don't see the ball, you see his leg, now you see his arm come over, now you see the ball. 
Mary Shaw, we, uh, I call it a doctor of pitching. Ricky Marte dijo, ¿cómo se le va a batear un individuo que levanta un pie, sube el guante, le da la espalda y le puede tirar uno? Eso dijo Mickey Marte. He's the best right-handed pitcher I've ever seen. Not only me, Hank Aaron, Andy Banks, Luke Snyder, Frank Robbins, they all say the same. He's the best right-handed pitcher that I've ever seen. In 1960, with the addition of Juan Marichal and Mati Alou, the San Francisco Giants had more African-American and Latino players than any other team in the major leagues. As a rookie, the first thing you have to do, you have to carry on Orlando equipment, like record players. Uh, uh, at that time, we don't have CDs, you know, we have the, 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 the big, uh, they call it long play. And we used, to, we used to carry those boxes, you know, and that, that thing is heavy. But you can't refuse. You have to do it. As a rookie, you have to do that. Because uh, uh, otherwise, you're going to have problem with Orlando. <laughs> you know, baseball may, uh, you know, sure it had its personalities, but at that time it was spitting tobacco and arguing with people. But I think when the Latins came into the game, it was, uh, wow. It was like a family when they came over. You know, we were very close. Myself, uh, Felipe, Jose Pagan. We were more than friends, you know, we were like brothers. We used to go together to eat, we used to go together to, 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 the, to the movies. We used to go shopping together. Felipe and I with uh, our compadre, Twice, you know, I baptized Felipe Lou, oldest daughter. Uh, he baptized my oldest, uh, Rosie. We knew that with some eyes, that ring of that group was not well liked, but hey, it was Orlando Cepeda, Juan Arechado, De Alou, hey, Jose Pegan. They couldn't mess with that group. We come from, from places that nobody ever heard of. Now, we don't go to Harvard or the Ivy League schools. It used to be white, black, and Latin. So we had to strike against us. We came after the black because of the language barrier, because of different customs. They pushed me around, you know. Uh, we go to the hotel and we can get in. We had to stay outside. The clubhouse, even in San Francisco, was segregated. It was very hard for me, becoming from Puerto Rico, I'm not used to that. The black people, the Afro-American, they're from here and they know, but to me it was very hard to get used to that. We were really a people that were doing the best that we could possibly do under the circumstances. Cincinnati, I was in second base and Joey J was pitching. Then you say, hey, Anna, Lani, vamos, mete línea, mete, hey, come on, bring me in, whatever. So he said to me, speak English. You don't know how to speak English? He said, yes, I know how to speak English. Kiss my ass. <laughs> In 1961, the Giants hired their former star, Alvin Dark, to manage the team. Dark was talented, but controversial. He treated me with great deal of respect. That's the only thing I can say, but he was a winner, and he tried to win. I, I love him. I love him. You know, he, he did a lot of things for, for us. But I, I understand that some of the players have s some difficulty with, with him. He was negative when he came with dealing with other ethnics, with other ethnic groups. You know, he's coming from Louisiana. And when he played, you know, not too many blacks, not too, not too many Latinos. So when he came to the Giants, so, so many Latinos going crazy in the dugout, you know, laughing, having fun, you know, young kids from Dominica, from Puerto Rico, he can comprehend what's going on. I remember, never forget this, in Phoenix, Arizona, he had a meeting, and he said, well, I assume you, you guys don't speak Spanish when we are working. I prefer for you, you, and you don't speak Spanish in the clubhouse. I said, but why not? There were some 
tough customer there. Orlando Cepeda was there. I'm Puerto Rican. He's Dominican. I'm proud of being Puerto Rican. I'm proud of my language. They feel the same way. Why we can't speak our language? Well, because some of the players are complaining that they don't know what we're talking about. I said, listen, when I came to America, I didn't know what you were talking about, and I tried to learn. I, I, I said, there's no way I'm going to talk English to Mary Lou, my brother. No way. How? How could I explain that to my, my parents? It's an insult to my Puerto Rican, to being Puerto Rican, for them to Dominican, and I know they feel the same way. I don't want to do it. I didn't do it. The season might have been over in the United States, but it was just beginning in the Caribbean, where some of the best baseball played anywhere took place each winter. They knew baseball very well. If you made bad plays out there, they start whistling. Whistling means, hey, you got to get out there and play. And just because you're over here doesn't mean that you don't have to go out and play. So sometimes I played hard over, harder over there than I did in the States because I could shag a little bit at home. It put more pressure on you down there than they do here, though, to win. So <laughs> if you don't get off to a good start down there, you're gone. They send you home. They could have made rules here. If you didn't hit the home runs quick, he's gone. As the 1960s began, the Dominican Giants' dominance on the field was at its height. By contrast, the Dominican dictator Trujillo's hold on his nation was beginning to slip. It was a regime of torture and, and death, and you had to keep your mouth shut. I believe the United States had at that time the power to unseat him, and he, he was allowed to tyrannized this country for 32 years. I lost friends and some relatives to, to the terror of the dictatorship. Assassin's bullet put a bloody end to the 31-year dictatorship of Dominican strongman Rafael Trujillo. He was killed in May 61, and uh, the people that love uh, freedom and, and liberty and democracy, that we were relieved. When Trujillo was killed, obviously, there was a vacuum of power. When something like that happens, you really don't know who's going to kill you, which side is going to, to, to shoot you. We were trying to play the Winter League during a general strike. And uh, we were stuck, the Escogido Club was stuck in Santiago for one week. That we could come home with the same clothes. And then they, the league was over, they, they canceled the season. I left Dominican Republic for spring training. I left my fiance here in Dominican, and uh, I can't concentrate. I was thinking about her all the time, and thinking about the situation in, in, in my country. And I asked Alvin Dark, you know, to, to give me permission to, to come to the Dominican Republic and get married and go back to spring training. So he did, you know, he was very generous. For the next few years, they would play baseball against the backdrop of political turmoil that came to a head when the United States intervened. 25,000, 50,000 Marines, United States Marines came to the country. Some of my friends are today, they tell me that they woke up one day and there, were, there was an aircraft carrier there and there were some airplanes making some flights over and, and all of a sudden there was some landing of soldiers. Very, very, very tough for all the Dominicans, knowing that people was getting killed on the street. It wasn't easy, it wasn't easy. I have to say that I resent the fact that troops from other countries, I'm not saying necessarily the American, but they have soldiers from other countries that at that time had dictatorship, and they, they were here in the Dominican telling me which way to go and which way to turn. I was very scared about my family, about my friends, because it was, uh, it was uh, uh, killing people in the street, you know, right and left.
Bueno, cuando en esa época ningún dominicano dormía. Eh, todos los, dominic do los dominicanos tenían su radito eh, 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 prendido. When the season started, I was at the top of my game and confidence-wise at the top of my career. The Giants uh, had an, an uh, all-star team, five players. Willie Mays, Orlando Cepeda, Felipe Aldu, Jim Davenport, and myself. At DC Stadium in Washington, here's that rare game that draws all the superstars together at one time, including sports-minded President Kennedy, looking as eager as the most avid fan. October 1962, and it's the second playoff series in the last four years for the National League. 1962, we ended up tied with the Dodgers, so we have to go to uh, uh, two out of three playoff. Now I'm pitching the third game. We lost in four to two. Hit four to two, but the Giants counted out so often during the season, bounce back again. They have a rally rolling in the ninth. They have all the pitchers ready on that team to save that two runs. For some reason, uh, they left Stan Williams pitch to Orlando Cepeda and Willie McCovey. Orlando Cepeda greets him with a fly to right field. A very unintentional walk forces Felipe Ballou across and the Giants lead. We scored four runs on that, on that innings. We end up winning the, the champion. And now it's on to San Francisco and the World Series with the New York Yankees. I remember it, uh, going back to San Francisco. We can't bring the airplane to the gate because it was a mob. I think the whole San Francisco city was uh, at the airport. The day after winning the National League pennant, the Giants returned to San Francisco to begin the 1962 World Series against the New York Yankees, marking the first time Dominicans played in the Fall Classic. Ya empezábamos a ver primero los primeros dominicanos en Serie Mundial. After defeating the Dodgers in a three-game playoff, right at Dodgers Day, we had to play the next day a day game against the Yankees at Candlestick Park. We were really tired. Playing against the Yankees, you know, everybody wanted to play either for the Yankees or against the Yankees, especially in the World Series. Era un toque de queda, como dicen aquí. Todo el mundo yendo al juego, esto que los otros comentarios por donde quiera que uno iba. Mickey Mantle and Elston Howard of the Yankees seem confident, and so does Felipe Ballou of the Giants as he warms up. The Dominicans excel throughout the series with Felipe and Mati Alou making brilliant catches in the outfield. But by game three, the Giants found themselves down two games to one, with Juan taking the mound for game four. Juan Marichal, high-kicking right-hander, will start for San Francisco. Whitey Ford, winner of the opener, will go for the Yankees. I get to pitch the fourth game in New York. I think I was pitching the best, the best game of my life. I strike out Mickey Mantle twice, and we were winning 2 nothing, going to the fifth inning. I was hitting, so Alvin Dark told the coach to give me the suicide squeeze sign. Tom Holley was coming from third, so I have to try to bunt that ball, and by trying, it was a ball four. The ball was going to hit my ankle. And I went down just to get that ball and put the bat on the ball. And instead of putting the bat, I put my finger, my index finger, and the whole nail came off. And that was the end of 1962 for 
like myself. We end up winning that game. Chuck Hiller hit a grand slam. A long drive deep to right field. Maris can't reach this one. It's gone. Davenport scores. Matty Alou scores. The Yankees won game five, and the series returned to San Francisco. But rain delayed play for three days. When the series resumed in soggy Candlestick Park, Felipe and Orlando rallied the Giants. Orlando Cepeda hammers the ball into deep right center. Mandel and Maris race for it. It's in between them for extra bases. And the Giants win 5-2. The series is tied at three victories each. And now the title rides on the final game. It's D-Day at Candlestick. Six months of baseball now spirals to a climax in just one game. The tense struggle moves into the Yankee fifth without a serious scoring threat on either side. And that brings Tony Kubek to the plate with the bases loaded, nobody out. Kubek hits sharply to Pagan and it's on to first for a double play, but Skyron scores to give the Yankees a one to nothing lead. When they score that run, I'll I, I never forget telling Orlando Cepeda, I said, Orlando, you know, that run is going to be very difficult to overcome because the wind was blowing. It was like a gale blowing straight in from center field. Matty Alou leads off for the Giants in the ninth. Beats out a drag bunt. With the score one to nothing, he represents the tying run. I made a perfect bunt. I make to first. and uh, So I say, well, I did my job. Matty Alou get on base. They tried to bunt Felipe Lou. I was asked to bunt, and I, the ball, I, I, I had to believe that the, the wind really blew that bunt foul. It was such, such a strong wind blowing. After one bunt attempt, Felipe Lou swings away. Boyer is relieved that he missed. Alvin Dart let me swing the bat because Boyer was almost underneath my bat, and I foul off the pitch. The third pitch, they threw a fastball up and in, and I struck out swinging. I, I really felt bad about it. Ralph Terry also strikes out Chuck Hiller. Now Elston Howard goes out to talk to Terry while the menacing Mays steps into the box. Willie Mays came up to bat with Maddie in first. He hit a ball to right field. Mays hammers the ball down the right field line. Maris with expert feeling. When the ball hit the ground and stopped there and give uh, Roger Maris, the, the opportunity to come and grab the ball, throw it to Bobby Richardson, and Richardson threw it to home play. It was a well executed replay. He threw the ball high speed, one, one hop to the catcher. And Mary Lou was being held at their base. He would have been out, no question about it. A lot of people say, oh, no, Marty could have, could have scored. There was no way. The relay stops him. He has to go back to third while Mays continues to second with a double. And thus the tying and winning runs are in scoring position. Manager Howe talks to Ralph Terry, a tense situation where a base hit could change the picture. Willie McCovey was the next batter. Everybody thought they was going to walk McCovey because uh, was Orlando was next and was a right-handed pitcher on the mound. He took the chance like a good gambler does. Willie McCovey hits a tremendous curving drive to right. But it's a foul ball, and the fans groan. McCovey slashes away again. A sizzling line drive. I never, I never saw a ball hit so hard in my life. Hit uh, one of the hardest ball I've ever seen in Riot Richardson, who, by the way, was playing shallow right field. Playing second base at shallow right field. And that was the end of it. The Yankees win one to nothing on a brilliant clutch effort by Ralph Terry, the hero of the 20th World Championship won by the New York Yankees. It could have won either way because if that ball was a little bit higher, I think he'd end up in the ocean. <laughs> could not believe we lost it, especially with a land drive like that. Well, imagine the seguidores de los gigantes aparte, como dominicano al fin. When you played seven games, seven good games, like we did in 1962, uh, you say, well, the best team won. And uh, we have to give them credit to the Yankees.
though the Dominican Giants have become one of baseball's best teams ever, they never returned to the World Series. And just one year later, at the end of the 1963 season, the Latin core of the Giants was torn apart. Back in the Dominican Republic, political turmoil continued to haunt the players. The Winter League season was cancelled. Still, the Dominican government, realizing how baseball could lift the spirits of Dominicans, organized a three-game goodwill exhibition against Cuban players. When Major League Commissioner Ford Frick learned of the series, he forbid Dominican and Cuban major leaguers from taking part. They played anyway, and Frick fined them. The fine so outraged Felipe that he wrote an article for Sport magazine recounting his experiences in baseball, from racism in the Deep South to the Fort Freak incident. I was free-minded. I'm, st I'm still that way. You can't change. And I, uh, I said some things that the Giants didn't like, uh, the commissioner of baseball didn't like. I didn't understand the power of the establishment at that particular time. He speak freely about what I think and I believe that's one of the reasons why they got a great deal of respect for Felipe because he did not hold back anything. Uh, everybody had to respect Felipe Lou. He was uh, the, 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 the leader of most of the Latin players. I played for Alvin two years and by the time the second year was over I knew I was going to be traded. Uh, there was something that they didn't like that I said. There was no shouting, there was no argument, but it didn't go very well. The first meeting that they had in the winter of 1963, I was gone to, to the Milwaukee Braves. To me, until these days, I don't know why. Because Felipe was most the premier baseball player in National League. It shocked me and it really hurt me. I missed the city, I missed the Cepeda and Juan Mary shot. And my brothers, it, it was very difficult. Uh, sometimes you, you make mistakes, you know, and I think that was one of the biggest mistakes uh, mistake that the Giants ever make. It was the beginning of the end of the Dominican and Latin Giants. Following Felipe's trade, Jose Pagan, Mati Alou, and Orlando Cepeda, the baby bull, would all be traded away. As the Dominicans moved from team to team, they continued to excel, representing themselves and their country in all-star games and the World Series. Mati Alou won the batting championship, and Manny Mota set baseball's all-time pinch hit record, while Juan Marichal became the winningest pitcher of the 1960s. Despite his infamous fight with Joan Roseboro, he became the most admired Dominican star of the decade. During his career, he won 242 times and completed 241 games. In the 1970s, Juan, Manny, and the Alos retired to become coaches and scouts. A new generation of Dominicans took to the field. By the 1990s, they had made the Ryland Nation the Republic of Baseball, the best source of talent in the game today. Then, in 2003, Felipe's career would come full circle. Please welcome Ray Durham, number 25, Barry Barnes. Ladies and gentlemen, today he becomes the only man in the history of the San Francisco Giants to be here for an opener in uniform at Seal Stadium, Candlestick Park, and Pacific Bell Park back with the Giants where he started since 40 years ago. Ladies and gentlemen, the manager of the Giants, number 23, Felipe Alou. I believe I have represented my country well, representing the Dominican baseball player. And not only that, representing baseball in general. Because when we put on a uniform, we are representing the game. And I feel, I always felt that way.
Now joining Felipe on the pitcher's mound, please welcome Maddie and Hazel Salou to throw out today's ceremonial first pitches. I know there's still some time to go. I have some time left with the Giants, and I pray God that nothing happened that, that, that would destroy what we believe we have built up over the course of a lifetime. But, I, but I'm proud of representing the Dominican Republic. In May 2005, the San Francisco Giants dedicated a statue of Juan Marichal. Felipe thanked his compadre Juan and said the statue represented all Dominican players and all Dominicans. That same day, Dominicans could be found playing throughout the majors. By opening day 2006, over 400 Dominicans have played Major League Baseball. By the time you're watching this, there will have been more. And Felipe, Manny, Juan, Osi, Mati, and Jesus personally coached or recruited many of them and served as heroes to them all. 